Why do people hate timer notes? Of all the tutorials I have put on my channel, I don't think I've been given as much heat for anything as much as I have been given for using timer notes of all things. So what is it about the timer node that gets people so caught up? I really love to know what you think about that. Today, we're gonna be going over the three ways that I'm aware of at least. Yeah, three ways to keep track of time in Godot and the different situations where you might wanna use them because um, in all fairness, there are points in time where you do want to use a timer node and there are other times when you don't want to use a timer node. So we're going to be covering all of that today. But first, if you need some help managing your own time on your projects, you need to check out our sponsor. ClickUp is a free project management tool that you guys can use to help keep you on top of your projects. If you guys don't know, for the last few months, I've been working hard making a massive course for Godot to make a third person shooter. Making such a long course with multiple sections is a lot to keep track of, which is where using a powerful productivity app like ClickUp comes in. ClickUp helps me track all of my videos I'm currently working on and plan for the ones that I have upcoming, which allows me to focus when it comes down to getting my course complete. Once I have an outline using the task list, I can organize them into the calendar and work out a rough schedule. And this really helps me keep focus on my goals and make sure I stay motivated to get the course completed. You can create folders for all your different projects. I have one for my third person shooter course, general YouTube video ideas, and of course an entire separate space for game ideas which is empty right now, been busy, all right. Uh, <laughs> but as an indie developer, we have so many hats to wear, which is why ClickUp is so useful. If you're making a game, whether you're working alone or in a team, ClickUp can help you plan and prioritize, allowing you to see the big picture and allocate for what's most important. Go to tryclickup.co slash shaftgames and use my code shaftgames to get started for free. And if you love ClickUp, my code will also give you 20% off if you decide to upgrade. Thank you again to ClickUp for sponsoring this video. Occasionally, you're gonna to need to know how much time has elapsed in your game. A really common example, I've got a tutorial series on coyote time, jump buffering, all these things with character movement that I've covered in the past. Something that I'm working on right now is a third person character tutorial, which patrons already have access to, by the way. For the sprint, we're using obviously a timer. I'm actually using Delta time for that. There are three main ways to keep track of time in Godot. You've got Delta, which is just the uh, time between the last frame and the current frame, which you can obviously use to work out how much time has passed between certain points in your game. You've got a scene tree timer, which is just something that you can instantiate by a code. And then you've got a node timer, which is this guy right here. Something that I think a lot of people don't know is that at the end of the day, they're all Delta time. So if we open up the docs and we look at the timer, uh, where is it? I've looked at this before. Oh uh, yeah, it's literally right in front of my eyes. I just can't read. Time left minus equals get process to Delta time. That like, so even in a timer, you're just subtracting Delta time at the end of the day. So they're all fundamentally the same things. It's just one where you're like handing off that functionality to the engine uh, versus doing it yourself. So like ultimately at the end of the day, like it's the same thing. It's just one, you're using a node, one you're using just a, a function call to this and the other you're just like subtracting the Delta time yourself in your own code. And it's all really just Delta. <laughs> It's all just Delta. Um, okay, those are the three ones that I'm gonna be showing you guys today. There might be others that I'm not aware of. You can let me know. So we'll start with the Delta timer, which is pretty straightforward. So the first thing that we do is we want a countdown time, obviously. So we'll make that an export variable so we can set it in the inspector. Obviously, it's gonna vary between what project you are doing, what kind of variables you need, but I'm gonna use a paused variable time remaining and a countdown complete variable. So what these will do is obviously will give us the ability to pause the timer, time remaining, we can just use that in place of countdown time so that we don't have to change the variable countdown time, it always remains whatever it's set at runtime. And countdown complete, obviously once it's done, we'll set that variable to true. So we only trigger the do something part of the, the code one time, right? In the ready function, we are going to set the time remaining equal to the countdown time. Uh, so this is just so that we start off with the timer counting down and we'll just need a process 
function after this and we can start actually putting stuff in. All right, so the first thing that we can do is to check if not paused. So we can just only run this if it's not paused, if that makes sense. And we can say if time remaining is greater than zero, then obviously we subtract delta from time remaining. As I explained before, delta is just the time between two frames. So it is in seconds. You just need to subtract it from whatever time you want. Uh, this just formats a string, so it gives us the number. So this is so I can set the label to be equal to the amount of time remaining. And then I'm just gonna set the text, the number text. Right. You might not need that depending on what you're doing with your timer. We can say elif not countdown complete. And so this is if the time remaining is less than zero, then we're gonna do something. Obviously for us, the first thing we're gonna do is set the countdown complete to true and we're gonna set text time up. Okay, and that should be the majority of the code there. We can run this and you can see the timer starts counting down and once it gets to zero, it switches to time up. All right, so we can introduce some controls here. This is just so you know that you can control it with these variable sets. Like I said, depending on what you're doing with your timer, you might not wanna do this. Um, this is just an example. So we've got if event is action pressed UI accept, which is just a space bar. This will reset the timer with this. So we'll set time remaining equal to countdown time. And we'll set it obviously countdown complete to false and we'll set paused to false as well. All right. And then if we want to pause it because we do have that variable there, we can say if event is action pressed pause. This is a, a variable that I set up ahead of time. So it's just the left mouse button click for me. And we can set paused equal to uh, the inverse of pause. So that'll just flip it every time you press the button. All right, so we, now we can run this. And if I left click, obviously you can see the timer stops. So pretty straightforward stuff. And we'll let this run down. And when it goes to time up, I press spacebar and it starts going again. So all pretty straightforward, really handy thing to know how to do because now you can create a timer without a timer node or a century timer. And that can come in handy quite a bit. So pretty straightforward, right? You just subtract the amount of time that you need. And this is really good for like self-contained situations. An example of this that I'm currently working on in my third person character controller is that I'm using a state machine for the sprint. The thing with scene tree timers and timer nodes is that they work with signals. And if you're using a finite state machine, you don't necessarily wanna have a signal that can fire to that script and activate that piece of code when you're not in that state. So. Uh, a delta, using delta for the time, for the sprint, makes more sense, right? Um, it, you can use a timer node or a scene chain timer for that. If you wanted to, it would be unconventional. I've done it before. Typically, as you can imagine, the guy that uses timer nodes for everything. So that is delta time. Okay, so the next one is the scene tree timer. Now, what is a scene tree timer if you don't know? Uh, well, it's just pretty much the same as a node-based timer, only it's instantiated in the tree. It has a few less functions, quite a stripped back version of a timer. So you really just have the variable time left and the function set time and get time left, right? You, you've just got that. And obviously the signal timeout. Okay, so like how this works is you go in and on your ready function, this is pretty similar. You've got a countdown time. I think it's five seconds for this one as well, even though I've got it set to 50 in, in here. Um, and we're also gonna store the scene tree timer in a variable. You don't actually have to do this. You can just call get tree dot create timer countdown time and then connect that. So you got your signal timeout, which I said before, and connect it to a function where you do something, right? In this case, we set time up because this is just a countdown timer. Pretty, pretty similar in terms of like what's happening, obviously. Um, in the process function, I'm just querying the amount of time left so that I can update the label text. And basically I'm just saying, hey, if, if this has time left, so if it's greater than zero, uh, run this function, which is set label text, which all it does is set the label on the text, which you'll see in a second. So realistically, um, if you only wanted the do something part of this function, none of this is necessary. So it really strips back on code. Scene tree timer, get tree dot create timer with your time timeout.connect and then your function to do something, right? Like that's literally it. So it's really good for very self-contained scenarios where you want something to happen in a certain amount of time. 
um, and you don't necessarily want to keep like a variable for it, like uh, in the process function, you're going to need to create a variable to keep track of when something's happened and then reset that if you want it to continually happen. Whereas in this case, you can just connect the timer and when it times out, it's going to do the thing that you want it to do. Uh, and then if you want, you can just like reset and create that and you can only, ju you can just set the condition for when the timer starts. So it's pretty good in terms of keeping your code neat and not having to create a bunch of like booleans to check things. Uh, that is pretty much it. The next one obviously is the timer node, which we are all probably familiar with. There is a node within Godot. So if you add a, a new node uh, and you look for the timer, you'll get the timer. And it's got a couple of functions here. You've obviously got whether or not you want the callback to happen in physics or idle. Uh, generally, obviously the default's idle, which makes more sense. Uh, there might be situations for process, uh, but for physics, I haven't kind of crossed them yet. Wait time, self-explanatory. How long do you want the time to last? One shot, is this gonna happen once? This is the interesting thing about timers. By default, it's not a one shot and it's not auto start, but if you start the timer, it just continually goes. So after five seconds, it'll just trigger again, uh, which I don't know. I feel like it, the opposite one shot as a default, but that's just me. Depends, I guess, how you use them. They're pretty good for like, if you want something to happen every five seconds, right? You could just set this and have the signal timeout. It's the exact same as the scene tree timer. Yeah, you do something. So like in terms of code, this is definitely the most basic one, right? Because you don't even, this is just so that I can set the label, right? You just need this. Very basic. If you wanted something to happen every five seconds, every 10 seconds, every minute, maybe you want your enemy to like go on a patrol every minute, or if you wanted to be able to have a cooldown on something, uh, they're great for that kind of thing, at least in terms of reducing the code. One thing that is different compared to a scene tree timer is that you do have the ability to pause these. So in theory, I could create an input, right? Um, I'll put that above process. So I could go uh, func underscore input event, and we could just say if event uh, dot is action pressed pause, and uh, we could say uh, timer dot paused is equal to the inverse of timer dot paused. Okay, let's have a look at that, see if that runs. Uh, I forgot to set it to auto start. So obviously you pause and then we click. So every time I click, I can un I can pause the timer. So something uh, that you can't really do with the others, I suppose you can do it with Delta. Um, nice. And um, then, yeah, you could set up a pause function in Delta timer, but scene tree timer definitely can't do this, right? Um, there is just no function for it. So you would need to uh, probably just stop the timer or something like that. I actually, I don't, I don't know. I just wouldn't use it for that, something like that. So that's the thing with these timers is you sort of have to just know what you can and can't do with them and which one is best for the given situation. Um, but that being said, they can pretty much be used the same way for each thing. It just depends on your preference. And that's the thing that sort of, um, you know, ties back to the, to the introduction. I get a lot of people in my comments section um, complaining about my use of time time and nodes. I, I find them better for videos because they're a little bit easier for beginners to understand. Um, and to be fair, it was the first one that I learned about. So it's just the one that I default to when I need something. Um, and I, I venture out depending on what the project needs. Like I said, with Delta time is really good for things like sprint because it's just simple. And you can say if the button is pressed, um, I'll flash that code up. We're just subtracting Delta until time's up. And then obviously you just add it back as time goes on. So in terms of performance, I, I highly doubt there's anything uh, there for performance. Uh, I mean, maybe someone needs to do a test where they instantiate a bunch of scene tree timers, node timers, and see what the difference is between them all. I highly, highly doubt it. Where's the last light camera? Let me, I think that just about covers it. Let me know if you have any other questions. Um, I'm really ha interested to hear about what people think about the, you know, like which timer is better. Uh, ultimately, my, my opinion is that it, it literally doesn't matter. Just use the one that you like to use um, and stop telling me that I'm bad for using a timer node, please. Uh, <laughs> other than that, actually, no, I don't care. Um, other than that, like, you know, 
I'm sure there are instances where it might matter. I just haven't come across them. Anyway, guys, that is all for now. I will see you again. I'm still working on a really big tutorial for the Godot third-person shooter. So that's still coming along nicely. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and like if you want to see more shout out to all the patreons on and the channel members obviously if you want to support the channel you can do so on patreon.com slash shaft games uh, right now we've got early access to the godot third person shooter tutorial there is three and a half hours of content if you're willing to jump into it uh, we haven't even got to the shooting part it's just the third person controller part um so yeah uh, so that's that's sort of the the value the value add there. Um, all right, guys, I'll see you in the next one.